Good afternoon. Welcome to Trinity United Church of Christ here in Waynesboro, Pennsylvania, an open and affirming congregation that truly tries to practice the statement that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. It is very strange saying good afternoon, mm -hmm. but with canceling worship this morning because of the ice, uh, your staff has gathered this afternoon to, to uh, stream our worship service live via Facebook, and of course it'll be recorded and later put on our website for, uh, for everybody to, to view. But um, if you are gathering with us online at this time, it's a joy to have you with us. There are a few announcements that I want to share with you. First of all, we will be de-hanging the greens. That's sort of a term that has come up for undecorating the sanctuary uh, from Christmas. Uh, but we'll be de-hanging the greens this coming Wednesday, the 12th, at 10 a.m. in the morning. So if you'd like to help take the Christmas decorations down, please consider coming in, weather permitting, on Wednesday at 10 a.m. That's really the only additional announcement that I believe I have for us this morning. I'd like to encourage <coughs> us now to prepare our hearts and our minds for worship through Carol Ann's organ prelude. We gather today to commemorate and to celebrate the Feast of Epiphany, which as you heard from Carol Ann's prelude, the We Three Kings, this is when we celebrate and commemorate the kings coming to visit the Christ child, the baby Jesus. 
I encourage you now to join me in our responsive call to worship. Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of God has risen among us. We are, we are awake. awake. We, we are, are alive. alive. Praise, Praise God, God for deliverance and, and blessings. blessings. Lift up your eyes to see all around you. Let your hearts rejoice and be radiant with hope. May, May justice water the earth, earth, earth like a shower. shower. Let, Let righteousness and peace abound. Receive again the promises of the gospel. Participate in the mystery of Jesus Christ. God's, God's ways are, are being revealed to us today. Our, our church, church proclaims the unsearchable riches of Christ. hearts and our minds together for our prayer of invocation. Let us pray together. Eternal, Eternal God, God, because, because your, your purposes, purposes become clear to us in Jesus Christ, Christ we, we come with boldness to claim our relationship with you. We are, we are grateful, grateful for pioneers in the faith whose stewardship has salvaged for us a way of life rooted in the gospel. The flames you ignited in them have not gone out in spite of our faithlessness. Your wisdom is still proclaimed in the church, challenging centers of earthly power with the claims of heaven. Today, our search for meaning has led us to this place of worship. You are here. We rejoice. Amen. The Epiphany season celebrates the all-inclusiveness of God. The mystery of Jesus Christ is revealed not to an elite few, but to the whole wide world. Yet we continue to build barriers to protect our own interests and to keep others at a safe distance away from us. If loyalty to God calls for accepting and embracing all God's children in love, we have, to, we have a lot to confess. Let us join our hearts and minds in our prayer of confession. God of light, we admit our retreat into the shadows of pretension and exclusion. How often we choose to associate with people who are like us and then look down on others who differ from us. It is easier to discover their sins than to admit our own. We judge the poor and join their oppressors while you call us to identify with those in need that all may prosper together. We imagine that we alone are faithful stewards of your grace, while you welcome as fellow saints with us many whom we ignore. Save us from our earthbound judgments that we may look up and be guided by the star that draws all people to yourself. Awed by your forgiving presence, we fall down to worship you. Amen. 
Through faith in Jesus Christ, we can come to, to God in boldness and confidence, assured of the gift of grace and empowerment of the Spirit. Lift up your eyes to see the glory of God. Receive light and receive healing, for God has come to dwell in us and among us. Let your hearts rejoice and your faces be radiant as we share the abundance of God's love. Amen. Arise, O Lord, it is come. The mountains were still sown. Rise up, mighty eagles, on the wing. God's power will make us strong. Our first scripture lesson this morning is recorded in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. I'll be reading from the third chapter of Ephesians, beginning with the first verse of that chapter. This is the reason that I, Paul, am a prisoner for Jesus Christ, for the sake of you Gentiles. For surely you have already heard the commission of God's grace that was given me for you and how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I wrote above in a few words, a reading of which will enable you to perceive my understanding of the mystery of Christ. In former generations, this <coughs> mystery was not made known to humankind, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That is, the Gentiles have become fellow heirs, members of the same body, and shares in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I have become a servant according to the gift of God's grace that was given me by the working of his power. Although I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to me to bring to the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ and to make everyone see what is, the plain, what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things? So that through the church, the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose that he has carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have access to God in boldness and confidence through faith in him. And our gospel lesson is recorded in Matthew's gospel, the second chapter of Matthew's gospel, the first 12 verses of that chapter. <clears throat> in the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we have observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all of Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for you shall come for, from, from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. 
Here ends the reading of God's word. May God add a special blessing to the reading and the hearing of the word. Amen. Join me in prayer. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of our hearts be upon you, you who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. For generations and generations, human beings have searched the night sky for meaning. Our ancestors discerned the forms of animals and heroes of all sorts and even gods in clusters of stars called constellations. Some went even further than that, imagining that the alignment of stars and planets on babies' birthdays somehow hinted at what their lives would be like. That's very likely what caused the Magi of Matthew 2, which I just read, to journey to Judea, whether or not they were priests of Persia's ancient Zoroastrian religion, as some people suspect, but it seems clear that they were also astrologers. Matthew's account of the star moving and then hovering over Bethlehem is likely his astronomically naive account of an astrological reading. This isn't to say, of course, that the Bible puts any stock in astrology. Matthew seems to understand the star's behavior as a miracle rather than a celestial science. However, Humanity's ancient and enduring fascination with the, the starry heavens could soon be endangered. The culprit today is light pollution. Astronomers have long, have long had to cope with encroaching artificial light from, from street lights, from car headlights, from advertising signs. They've learned to locate observatories on barren mountaintops in remote locations, far from the nighttime glow of urban and suburban sprawl. I remember on my trips to Algonquin, the boundary waters of Ontario, Canada, where you could only get to your campsite by canoe and where there is nothing else in the provincial park but trees, moose, and wolves, and where you can go almost a whole week without seeing another human being except those of your own camping group. We would sit out on the beach at night along the lake and marvel at the celestial sky. Besides the constellations that virtually popped out at you from the darkened sky, we used to have a contest to see who could spot the first satellite orbiting the Earth. There are actually dark sky preserves at various remote locations around the world, even in the United States. Some of our great national parks in the West bear this designation, including parts of the Grand Canyon, Death Valley, and Joshua Tree. For urban people, perpetually dazzled by the glare of street lights and headlights, traveling to one of these starlit locations is a true revelation. But now even the most remote telescopes may have difficulty scanning the heavens and dark sky preserves could become a thing of the past. The problem is still artificial light, but now the light is coming from a different place. It's coming not from the earth, but from the sky itself. Let me explain. The SpaceX company has started launching not just single satellites into orbit, but great orbiting arrays of satellites. Back in the summer of 2020, the company launched an array of 6,500 pound satellites into orbit. Eventually, it plans to place thousands of these mini satellites into the night sky. The plan is to bounce radio signals off them to improve our internet access here on Earth. And Lord knows we all need that. 
<laughs> but radio signals are not the only <clears throat> thing that bounces off these satellites. Each of them is powered by solar panels. And these panels not only collect sunlight for their photocells, but they also reflect some of that light back to the Earth. Amateur stargazers can already glimpse these new work, workhorses of the internet trudging like a pack train across the night sky right in front of familiar constellations that have been there forever. The SpaceX people have gone so far as to describe their handiwork, handiwork as a new constellation. They call it Starlink. Starlink satellites are tiny, of course, compared to the size of real stars, many of which are larger than our own sun, but they're a lot closer. A 500-pound satellite in low Earth orbit can appear brighter than a gas giant thousands of light years away. Astronomers and amateur stargazers are not amused. They're rallying to oppose these new plans. For a long time, astronomers have had to discard a fair number of photos taken through their telescopes because a traditional satellite or even the International Space Station entered their photo frame, thus rendering the photo useless. Now, though as hundreds and soon thousands of mini satellites show up in their field of view, they're afraid it may become impossible to snap a photo of the natural sky. They'll no longer be able to see the real stars they're looking for because so many artificial ones are getting in the way. A recent article on this problem puts it this way. Elon Musk, who is, is SpaceX's founder and chief executive, has offered assurances that the satellites will only be visible in the hours after sunset and before sunrise, and then just barely. But the early images led many, many scientists to question his assertions. The first captured images, for example, revealed a train of spacecraft as bright as Polaris, the North Star. And while a press officer at SpaceX said the satellites will grow fainter as they move to higher orbits, some astronomers estimate that they will be visible to the naked eye throughout summer nights. The satellites can even flare briefly, boosting their brightness to rival that of Sirius, which is the brightest star in the sky, when their solar panels are oriented just right. Astronomer Kelsey Johnson warns in the New York Times, with populations swelling and demands for lighting increasing, the global amount of artificial light at night has been growing at, by at least 2% each year. At this rate, the amount of light pollution originating from Earth-based sources alone will double in less than 50 years. Johnson points out that artificial light endangers not only human health and our environment, but that it also extorts a philosophical cost. He says, I think there is even an existential cost a dark night sky unpolluted by artificial light and thousands of artificial satellites serves as a visceral reminder that we are part of something unfathomably larger than ourselves, than our petty differences, than our, uh, that our petty differences on this tiny speck of a planet are ultimately insignificant. In the face of the universe, human arrogance is absurd. Elon Musk has defended his company's plans as being for the greater good. Supplying internet access all over the world. But some astronomers are asking, who's greater good? Who has the right to decide that? Asks Dr. Tyler Nordren, one of the astronomers questioning the SpaceX plans. The night sky has the power to make people feel awe, he points out. A star-filled night sky reminds us that we are part of a much larger whole, that we are one person in, in a world of people surrounded by the vast depths of the visible universe. It's the same feeling the ancient writer of Psalm 8 expresses when he says, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, 
What are human beings that you are mindful of them? Mortals that you care for them? It's the experience, it's the feeling experienced by the Magi of old. Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. You know, we really know very little about the Bethlehem star. What sort of astro astronomical configuration exactly may have excited the attention of those learned Persian stargazers. Although, of course, there are many fascinating theories. Surely we don't need to understand the science behind the phenomenon, though to grasp the feeling of awe that spills over to our earthly spirits as we contemplate the heavens. We've just come out of the Christmas season filled with glowing distractions of all kinds. All the trappings of the secular holiday we know all too well. These lesser constellations in the night sky of our faith are not bad things in and of themselves, but we all know that, that they have the potential to turn our gaze away from things that truly matter. When the Magi gazed up into the heavens plotting their star charts, the backdrop to the Bethlehem star was every bit as dark as the sky still is above the Grand Canyon or Death Valley. Yet, what if it had been otherwise? Think about that. What if they'd had to contend with light pollution? What if a string of flashing satellites had, had commanded their attention instead? Here's the point. So many of the distractions of the secular holiday are like those orbiting satellites, light pollution, obscuring the true light, the light of the world. These distractions are cheap, flashy ornaments encroaching on a glittering Christmas tree filled with family heirlooms. We do well to keep our field of view unobstructed, our vision pure for the true star we seek. Way back in 1959, the great Jewish scholar Abraham Joshua Heschel had an ominous premonition of what was to come. In between God and man, he warns, the awareness of the grandeur and the subline is all but gone. We teach our children how to measure, how to weigh. We failed to teach them how to revere, how to sense wonder and awe. The sense for the sublime the sign of the inward greatness of the soul is now a rare gift, he said. Yet without it, the world becomes flat and the soul is a vacuum. Here is where the biblical view of reality must serve as our guide. To remain spiritually healthy, we must pay close attention to what we're seeing and what we're looking at. We must preserve our access to the visions that inspire awe in our hearts. The Fault in Our Stars is the title of a 2014 film about two teenage cancer survivors pursuing love and life. Hazel, one of the pair, refers to Augustus, or Gus, uh, as her star-crossed lover. It's a famous phrase from Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Of course, the idea is that the lover's tragic fate was somehow written in the stars. In a memorable scene from the film, Gus confesses to Hazel. He says, I am in love with you, and I know that love is just a shout into the void, and that oblivion is inevitable, and that we're all doomed and that one day all our labor will be returned to dust. And I know that the sun will swallow the only earth we will ever have. And I am in love with you. We would like to think that the love we share with others on this earth is just as enduring, but considering our lot realistically, we know it to be otherwise. Take a walk through an old cemetery, one with epitaphs on the stones, and you'll see expressions of love from people who haven't breathed this earthly air for decades, even centuries. Their sentiments 
Carved in the stone live on, even though their love itself has long since been swallowed up by, and we trust, has found perfection in the greater and eternal love of God. As fascinating as the biblical account of the Bethlehem star is, and as awe-inspiring as are the constellations above a dark sky preserve, it's not the stars we seek. The Magi weren't seeking the stars either, at least not ultimately. They valued their special star merely as a pointer to the child-born king of the Jews. There's a fault in our stars, and not just in the blinking sky train of satellites that we know as the Starlink array. <clears throat> the fault in our stars is whatever turns our attention away from the true star, the true North Star, he who is the source of everything good in our lives, Jesus Christ. Let us seek him above all others this Epiphany Sunday, this new year that has just begun, and every year that is to come. Amen. Amen. We come to the portion of our worship experience where we lift up and share one another's burdens through our prayers of the people. Um, I just have one update to share with you. Uh, Paul Dunlap had surgery uh, about two weeks ago. Uh, he is home from the hospital, but um, there are some, some major issues that he's still having. Um, he still can't get out of bed and walk on his own. Uh, Barb and I talked, and uh, it just seems that they might have sent him home from the hospital too soon. But anyhow, they're still trying to work out some of his issues. But he is home, and he is recovering. But recovery is a slow process for Paul. Um, those, that's the only really announce or update that I have. I don't have any additions unless there's anything online, nothing online, and none of our staff here. Um, has anything to add. So I commend you to pray for each other, to pray for the needs of this world, because Lord knows there are many needs that exist within our world. Let's join our hearts and our minds together in prayer. God of wonder and mystery, God of the stars and God of the universe, God of winding paths, and straight paths. We gather together today with gratitude for the gift of your constant presence, your trustworthy guidance, and, you, and your daring risk-taking with us. You dare to love us despite our inability to respond fully. You dare to care for us despite our challenge in caring for others. You dare to walk with us despite our fickleness. On our own journeys toward the stars and guiding points you put before us, you continue to lead us forward, guiding us by the teachings of Jesus to seek justice, to love kindness, and walk humbly in your abiding shadow. As we struggle with the political wrangling of this world, the wars waged for both justice and greed, the violence committed daily against the innocent, let alone the pain of broken relationships and loss, you remain steadfast in your care and devotion for your entire creation throughout the universe. It's almost too much to take in sometimes, and even in our doubts and disbelief, our struggle to understand and constantly misunderstanding and our flat-out ignorance about your ways, you remain constantly present with us. We pray for peace in this world, Lord, the kind of peace in which we celebrate diversity and joy, are joyfully challenged by adversity and share in the joy that is to be found everywhere. We pray for those who are lonely, that you might lead us to reach out and be friends. We pray for those who are hungry, that you might lead us to offer sustenance. We pray for those who are lost, that you might lead us to give hope and direction. We pray for the countries of the world that we might find a way to work together to lift one another up. We pray for our leaders in Washington that your spirit may guide them to set an example for our country and the world, 
to work together rather than against one another. We pray for our denomination, the United Church of Christ, that we might seek to build up this body and seek to repair the theological divisions that are tearing us apart. And we pray for ourselves, that we might continue on this journey, learning the lessons you offer, seeking the fullness of your perfection, and live as you would have us live. These prayers and hopes we offer in confidence and gratitude of your love and presence. And as we pray together the prayer which you taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> As we begin a new year, 2022, we again, I'd like to take a moment to just again acknowledge the needs of your church and the ways that we are trying to reach out in mission to not only our community at Waynesboro, but our mission to, to the entire world. And I just ask that you consider how you might become a better steward of the resources that you have, whether it's your, your time, your treasure, or your talents. We, I ask you to try and find ways of using those gifts, those God-given gifts, for the glory of God and for the mission of the church universal throughout the world. Help us to try and find new ways of spreading the love of Jesus throughout the world. Let's join together and dedicate our offerings as we pray together the prayer of dedication. For the joy of giving, we offer the products of our labor for the ministry of this church in outreach to the world. With concern for those who are poor, oppressed, and needy, we rededicate ourselves as helpers and advocates. Out of devotion to Christ, we commit our best that the church may bear witness among the principalities and powers of the world. Help us all, O oh God, to be faithful stewards. Amen. sends us on our way, a bold and confident people. Look up and be guided by the star of joy. We will, we will open, open our eyes to the presence, presence of God. God. We, will we will look, look for, for God's, God's activity, activity all around us. God's purposes in Christ are to be lived out by us. We are called to invite others to share in God's grace. We will, we will witness, witness to all who have seen and heard. And heard. By God's power, we will minister to others. The glory of God has risen among us. We are blessed beyond all deserving. What we have received, we pass on with joy. We offer to all the unsearchable riches of Christ. Amen. 
Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Thanks be to God. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.